funny. Well, I, I just want to say that I am so delighted to be here. And for those of you that I did get to meet four years ago, I couldn't wait to see you all again. And for those of you who I haven't met yet, I'm looking forward to being with you uh, today, tomorrow, throughout the week, next Sunday, the f Sunday after. So we get to be here long enough that I feel like I will have a chance to visit with, I hope, all of you. So. Um, this is just a real treat, and uh, I am thankful to be here. But, um, so what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to change a couple things. So the first thing is um, I am going to do my second talk first today, and there's a reason why, which I want to explain. So in your notes, if you want to turn to... Um, when you feel like you're the poster child for unmet expectations, we'll start there. And there's a couple reasons why. But first of all, what I would like to do is just explain to you this whole series that I'm doing here. Um, and it's been a number of years ago now. I was first asked to teach on unmet expectations. And so I thought, well, that's an interesting topic. I'd never thought of that before. But then I realized... I, you know, everyone deals with unmet expectations. We, we all have that. And so it kind of started this journey for me of just looking in the scriptures of, um, you know, how God, how we are to deal with unmet expectations in our lives. And we all have them in different places. And so what I've done is I've actually put together 10 different talks all in this same series on unmet expectations. And so these four that I'm doing for you today are the, are the A-level ones. You all get the super intense, um, the ones that you've kind of, uh, you, you're not entry-level unmet expectation girls anymore. You have graduated to the upper echelons of unmet expectations. And I think part of that is just because of the constant teaching that you all receive here on, on, that is so excellent. And so uh, we'll be digging in at, uh, you might be feeling that uh, we're, I'm giving you huge shovelfuls, but part of that is just because these are kind of more the end talks, they're not the beginning ones, and which is part of why I wanted to switch um, to this talk first instead of the other one, uh, because I think this will kind of help uh, adjust your thinking and bring you in a little bit more um, before we start dealing with um, some of the other topics. So that was part of it. But I also wanted to just explain some of the unmet expectations before we jump into this talk. So unmet expectations. We can have expectations for things that are as simple as um, I was intending to go shopping this afternoon, only now I, am, I spilled my tea all over the carpet and I need to get that clean. And so my day is spent cleaning the carpet and it's not how I planned it. You know, it can be little things like that where my day just turned out completely different and I'm trying not to grumble and complain because my day is different. It can be that kind of simple or it can expectations of what we thought our lives were going to be like. For some of us, um, if we find I'm 45 years old and I've never been married and I thought by the time I was 45, I would be married, that I would have a, a huge group of children following in me and like ducklings as I come into church, only that is not what God has given me. And I have struggled with discontentment over that. And so, you know, expectations can be these little things that um, really are sometimes just little areas that we need to adjust our attitude. I'm kind of grumbly today, I'm kind of complaining because my day turned out different, and so I just need to adjust that to some really, uh, the big things in life where we really, really struggle, where I never expected that um, I would be in a wheelchair, my health is not good, or these kinds of things where I don't know how to uh, respond to that. And so we deal with grief, we deal with anger, we deal with bitterness, and so how can we 
take those ugly attitudes and take them to the Lord and then ask the Lord to begin to change those? How can we begin to counsel ourselves through the word? And so that is kind of the whole series that I have put together is how do we do that step by step in different areas of our life? So in this session, we're going to be dealing with when you feel like you're the poster child for unmet expectations, when you just feel like my whole life has been full of unmet expectations. Well, why is that? Why has God allowed that for you? There's certainly got to be a purpose. And if that is the case, then how can I respond well and give him glory so that I'm not this grumbly, awful person to be around that no one wants to be near me because I'm the bitterness cloud as soon as I walk in the door. And so you can tell people don't want to talk to you because they scurry away. Um, we don't want to be like that. So then how can we begin to take those really deep, grief-stricken kinds of things, those deep things of our hearts, and then take them to the Word of God and begin to have God's Word begin to change our responses. So that's what we're going to be working on today, all day long. And, uh, but I hope that I will give you some practical kinds of step-by-step -step things. Now, I just want to say that um, I never write anything that hasn't first gone through me. So I feel like I am the queen of expectations, and you all just get to listen in while I counsel myself. And if you find anything that you can relate to, I hope that that's helpful. But really, um, I think that for the most part, if we're women, we we have expectations about things. We have these ideas, what life is going to be like. We have, you know, things that we're hoping that God will do in us or through us. And then it just sometimes things are different. And so then how can we work on those things? So I wanted to kind of give you that, that little bit of background to that, so hopefully you'll understand where we're coming in. We're coming in a little bit in the middle of things, but I think you're ready. So uh, let's go to the Lord, and then we'll just jump right in. Father, we do come before you. And I feel so much that uh, for first thing in the morning, I am asking all of these women to jump into the deep end of the pool with me. And so, Father, I ask that you would help them to tread water well and to, um, to swim to shore as you always give us your word that um, is our life raft. Father, thank you so much. And we ask that you would um, help them to listen well, help me to speak only through um, your grace and with your spirit aiding me. And Lord, I thank you for the new cushions, how delightful they are. Thank you so much. And I ask that you would um, bless your word richly. May it minister to our hearts and change us and give us um, just the encouragement and strength that we need each day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, the new cushions. Aren't they wonderful? <laughs> so great. When we were here last time, I remember there were only a few little cushions, and uh, everyone would look longingly at the ones who were sitting on the cushions. I don't know, was that how it was until just recently? <laughs> I'm like, oh, you try not to covet while you're in church. <laughs> Well, we're going to, in this session, kind of begin looking at just an overview of Joseph's, Joseph's life. So we're going to be in Genesis, and I'm going to kind of, we're going to be looking at it in a big picture. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with Joseph's story. He was the young man who had the coat of many colors. Uh, he was the one that um, had something in his life to do with a pharaoh and some dreams about some cows and some corn, um, something about saving everyone from famine and starvation. Uh, that's, so that's Joseph, and his life was really pretty remarkable. Um, in fact, 
is parts of his story, his life was really amazing at how it turned out. And when he was um, a little boy, he was the golden child. And it seemed that everything in his life was destined for just wonderful, good things for him. But his life really has more twists and turns in it than you know, a stream does. It just, everything in his life turned out different than it seemed like it was going to. And Joseph may have been born with a silver spoon in his mouth, but it's more true that really he was born for adversity. And his story is recorded in the book of Genesis, which I know you all know. And um, his life might have proceeded normally, except for a few things. All might have gone well for Joseph in his life if he hadn't been the long-anticipated son of his father's most loved wife, Rachel, as it tells us in Genesis 30. Now, if that had not happened, if he hadn't been this child that she had waited for, for so long. Things might have gone well in his life, and things might have gone well for Joseph, except that his mother, Rachel, died while she was giving birth to his younger brother, Benjamin. Um, and in Genesis 37, when he's a young man of 17, we think, well, things might start going well for Joseph at this stage, except that his father, sends Joseph to go out and check on his older brothers and bring back a report about them. And unfortunately for Joseph, he has to bring back a bad report because his brothers weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. And for a younger brother to be checking on older brothers, that is not a good thing. But even after that, Things might have gone well for Joseph, except that in Genesis 37, 3 through 4, we learn, now Israel, or Jacob, his father, loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age. And Joseph, or Jacob had made Joseph a very colored tunic. And his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. And even after that, things still could have worked out. Things still could have gone well for Joseph, except that we read in Genesis 37 in verses 5 through 11 that Joseph had a dream that he actually blurted out to his brothers, which made him hate them made them hate him even more because it appeared from the dream that Joseph had told his brothers that the older brothers were going to bow down to their younger brother, which was not something they thought was a great idea. And then J or Joseph had another dream, and he, uh, Joseph told this one even to his father and his brothers where it said that the father... Jacob and the brothers bowed down to Joseph. And even this time, Jacob, Joseph's father, rebuked Joseph for being proud. What are you saying that I would be bowing down to you? But all Joseph had done was just tell his family what he had dreamed the night before, that it, it seemed like an odd dream. And yet, because of the circumstances in his life, things were not proceeding well for Joseph at this time. And uh, now things might have gone well for Joseph, and we can hope that things might have proceeded well. Um, but in verses 12 through 17 of Genesis 37, we see that Jacob sends Joseph again to go check on his brothers. And when he arrives at the, the pasture land where his brothers are supposed to be, they're not there. And yet there's a man just who happened to be out in the fields there who happens to know where his brothers went. And so Joseph hurries on to go find his brothers so he can check on them, so he can take back a report to his father. Even though things hadn't gone well when he had done that before, he's still being a faithful son. 
But we knew it wasn't going to go well for Joseph at this point when, as his brothers see him in Genesis chapter 37 and verses 18 through 24, it tells us that his brothers began to plan some dreadful thing for him. And when they saw him coming, they began to badmouth Joseph to each other and began to say all these things about how, what a terrible guy Joseph was. And they came up with a plan to get rid of their brother. So that by the time they saw him walking up to them, they had come up with this terrible plan and they had created so much bitterness in their hearts just through their bad-mouthing him. Now things still could have turned around in Joseph's life at this point, except that there were some Ishmaelite traders who happened to be coming along right at that time, and they came into the camp, and his brothers decided, hey, let's just get rid of our brother once and for all. And uh, they traded him uh, with the, the Ishmaelite traders. But the Ishmaelite traders, because they had come along just at the right time, things were not going to be going well for Joseph. And at that point, here he was, this young man of 17 years old, who had just been sold to these traders by his brother, his brothers, and he now proceeded for at least a 15-day journey on foot um, through the desert. And he was now a slave. He had gone from being one of the, mo the most loved son of his father to being a slave as he's traveling through the desert. And things were not going well for Joseph at this point in his time, in his life. But still, things might have gone uh, easier for Joseph even when he had arrived in Egypt. Um, if he had any hope that his family might come after him. But after seeing his brother's bitterness and rage and anger against him, he knew that all was lost and that he was all by himself. And his despair at this point was complete and total. And then in Genesis 39, we read that um, Joseph was in Egypt. He was bought by Potiphar and brought into this man's household. And that we learn that Potiphar was the captain of the bodyguard for Pharaoh. And the Lord was gracious. And so it seemed that Joseph's life was maybe starting to turn around and get a little bit better because everything that was entrusted to Joseph um, by Potiphar began to prosper and do well. And things still might have gone well for Joseph at that stage in his life if he had been homely and awkward. But he was a handsome young man. And Potiphar's life was looking for love in all the wrong places. And she was looking for love in too many faces, as uh, an old song used to say. And she noticed Joseph, and she began to set her eyes on him. And Joseph um, was able to evade her and stay away from her, but she pursued him day after day after day. Now, things still might have gone well for Joseph. He was able to stay away from Potiphar's wife, except that one day she worked it out so that all the other men of the household were gone and only Joseph was in the house with her. And she intended to seduce him. And when he uh, realized what was going on, he was able to flee from her, but she had grabbed his robe outside of his, uh, his garment. And she makes such a scene, and she said that he tried to attack her and rape her. Well, it, you know that um, a slave who is accused of raping or trying to rape his master's wife, nothing good is going to happen to Joseph. And it looked like at this point in his life that there was never, ever, ever going to be anything good that was ever going to happen to Joseph. Because slaves who tried to do such a wicked thing to their master's wives would never come out of prison. 
And yet, even in prison, things began to go well for Joseph because the Lord prospered Joseph so that um, the chief gave, uh, chief jailer gave him freedom and more responsibility to take care of the prisoners. And it was at that time in Joseph's life that uh, Pharaoh's cupbearer and Pharaoh's baker, who had been thrown into prison because Pharaoh was mad at them, they had some dreams, and Joseph was uh, able to interpret these men's dreams. And um, the cupbearer was restored to his position, just as Joseph had, had foretold. The baker was uh, put to death, just as Joseph had foretold. And so it seemed like, oh, well, maybe uh, the cupbearer will remember me to Pharaoh, and I will get out of prison. But that is not what God had for Joseph. And so his life continued to not go well as he stayed in prison, because the cupbearer completely forgot about him for two more years. And yet, by the time we get to Genesis chapter 41 in Joseph's story, we begin to have some anticipation that maybe something is changing for Joseph in his life. Because Pharaoh begins to have some dreams. He has two dreams about a prolonged famine that will happen in the land. And these dreams scare Pharaoh. They, they must have really been something. Because people, I mean, we're used to having dreams. So these dreams were so real and so scary that Pharaoh um, is, is barely able to function. And finally, at this point, the cupbearer remembers the young man who was able to interpret his own dream. And so he tells Pharaoh about it. And so Pharaoh um, was so disturbed by his dream that he says, get that guy. I want him to come and tell me what my dream means. And so instantly, Joseph is brought out of prison. He's cleaned up. And he is brought before Pharaoh to listen to and interpret Pharaoh's dream. And things really begin to go well for Joseph now at this stage in his life um, because he is not only able to interpret the dream, but to give Pharaoh wise counsel on how to deal with the, fam the famine that was going to come upon Egypt. And that very day, Joseph is made ruler in Egypt second only to Pharaoh. And so in one day, Joseph goes from being a slave with not, no change in his circumstances whatsoever. And by the end of the day, he goes to bed second ruler in Egypt. Our lives can change like that, can't they? And the Lord moved Joseph from this narrow to little to confined space into what, the, as the Bible says, a wide space, a place of blessing. And yet still, Joseph is missing his family. He's still separated from his family. And back in the land of Canaan, Jacob and his sons um, and their families are starting to experience the famine that uh, Joseph had explained would come upon the land. And it had spread even into the land of uh, Canaan at this point. And so Jacob sends his 10 sons there, though he doesn't allow his youngest son, Joseph's brother, Benjamin, to go um, to that land. And eventually Joseph sees his brothers and when they arrive in Egypt to buy grain for their families, but they don't recognize him. And so he finagles a way to learn more about his brother uh, or his father and his brother Benjamin to see if they're alive. And through a series of circumstances, he ends up having Benjamin brought to Egypt and all of these things in the heat where he is finally able to reveal his true identity to his brothers. Because up until that point, they didn't even realize who he was. And finally, after 17 years of waiting, things began to go well for Joseph. He's reunited with his brothers. He has assurance that his father is alive. And um, he's able to tell his brothers that there is nothing. I carry no bitterness or animosity towards you. I forgive you. And in Genesis 45, starting in verse 4, it says, Then Joseph said to his brothers, Please come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be great, grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. 
for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. And what we see in Genesis 45 and verses 4 through 8 is three times Joseph says, God sent me here. And all of a sudden for Joseph, all those unmet expectations, all the tangled threads of his life, all came together and it began to have purpose. He finally understood even what was going on, why God allowed all of those really hard things that had happened in his life. Now he understood why he had been separated by his fam- from his family. Now he understood why even his brothers had hated him so that he could, but for, by God's good plan, go ahead of his family to Egypt to prepare food for them so he could save his family. And his brothers, when they listen to Joseph tell them this, that God sent me before you to this, they're still afraid of what he might do, which you know, they, they were pretty awful to him. And it says in Genesis 50, in verse 19, that jo- Joseph tells them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. And when we we look at Joseph's life, I think he's the perfect guy to say, here is someone who had unmet expectations. We might have unmet expectations, but I think probably for the most of us, we wouldn't say we have had lived with as many or even as long as uh, Joseph did. But for 34 years, from the time of his birth until the time when he reveals um, his who he is to his brothers, he lived with a lot of unmet expectations where God God didn't explain what was going on in his life. And um, he had expectations. Probably, you know, I tried to think about what would it have been like for Joseph? You know, what kinds of things would he probably have struggled with? Maybe some that are similar to ones that we have struggled with at time. Uh, For Joseph, maybe he had an expectation that mothers are not supposed to die when you're a boy. Maybe he had an expectation that fathers are supposed to love all their children equally and not single out one over another. Maybe he had an expectation that brothers are supposed to love their little brothers and to live um, peacefully with them. Maybe he had expectations that families are supposed to support us in our dreams and uh, especially the ones that are given to us by God. Uh, Maybe he had expectations that brothers aren't supposed to sell their little brothers into slavery. I mean, that's probably a good expectation to have. We wouldn't want that one. Um, And he definitely probably had the expectation that the brothers would never tell the truth about that. Um, He wouldn't think that brothers would cover it up for that long. Um, Maybe he had expectation that faithfulness is supposed to be rewarded. Instead, what he experienced was um, being framed for rape, a reputation that was trashed. Um, He was thrown into prison. Um, He he maybe had expectations that the trials in his life wouldn't last as long as they did. And um, And yet they did. God had a plan in that. There was a purpose. But in one day, it all changed for Joseph. It all changed, and he began to understand what God had been doing, how he had been orchestrating all these different parts of Joseph's life so that it all came together with this one miraculous, amazing plan that God was going to use Joseph's life 
to actually preserve the nation of Israel. So what can we learn uh, from the Lord about Joseph's story? Well, we can learn, first and foremost, that God um, is sovereign over every event in our lives, just like he was sovereign over every event in Joseph's life. My husband has said, you know, Jacob favored Rachel so Joseph could be favored, so he could check up on his brothers and bring back a bad report and be hated for it, so he could receive the coat of many colors, so he could be hated more, so he could have two more sets of dreams, so he could be hated more, so he could uh, be sent to check up on his brothers a second time, so he could find the man in the field who knew exactly where his brothers were, so he could find them, so he could be thrown into a pit instead of killed, so he could be sold as a slave while Reuben was away, so he could rise to power in Potiphar's house, so Potiphar's wife could lust over him because he was so handsome so he could be framed for rape so he could be thrown into prison so he could interpret the cupbearer's dream so he could interpret Pharaoh's dream so he could be made ruler of all Egypt so he could save the nation of Israel from the famine from which the Messiah and Savior of the world would come so you and I could be saved. Is that wonderful or what? All the little pieces of Joseph's life came together. Now what's amazing about this is that um, it's not a, this wasn't a big deal for the Lord to do this. But what was amazing is that Joseph had no idea what God was doing. He was just living his life. He was just going through all the day-to-day -day things, just like you and I. We're just going through. We don't know what God is doing necessarily in our lives. And God is not in a hurry. God wasn't in a hurry with Joseph. Like You'd think that God would have kind of sped things up from the time that uh, Joseph is a 17-year-old boy and ends up going to Egypt and he's spending 17 years as a slave. You'd think the Lord, out of his love for Joseph, would have hurried that up, you know, maybe just a couple years where he's a slave. But no, 17 years he was in Egypt as a slave. And yet, at the right time, at the right place, with just the right purpose and or plan, God's plan is revealed for Joseph's life. And we see over and over again in the scriptures that God in his sovereignty has a plan. Romans 5, 6 tells us, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Galatians 4, 4, we see, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And in Titus 1.3, we see God at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. And 1 Peter 5.6 tells us, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. And all those verses Remind us again that God has a plan. There's no rushing what God has put in place because God has planned all of these details from before time began. They, they tell us something about God's character, don't they? And even just looking at Joseph's life, we see that God is not rushed, that God has a purpose and order to all the details. Psalm 33:11 says the counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart from generation to generation. So the Lord has a plan for your life that he put into place before time began. The plans of his heart from generation to generation, that's what Genesis thirty-three eleven says, that the counsel of the Lord stands forever. He has purposed it, and he has a plan. And when God plans it, nothing changes it. Uh, Job 42, 2 says, um, where Job began to understand this about God as Job himself was dealing with some of these same kinds of things in his life, Job said, I know, Lord, that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. 
Now, I've had a few events in my life where this truth, truth has been revealed, like in you know, bold lights above my head, like, this is God's plan for you, and I've seen it, and I've gotten it. But a lot of times, it, that fl- sign might be flashing, but I am not seeing it. I am not getting it, and I'm struggling. And there are times when we, we do kind of like, oh, God's doing something, and we begin to clue in to uh, what is happening. But usually, um, those kinds of understanding what God is doing doesn't really come along until we're kind of through some of the hard things. And then, all of a sudden, we, it's like we wake up and we say, oh, God was, he was teaching me something. He was teaching me patience. I didn't realize that. Some of those kinds of things. We can struggle at times with God's plan for us. Lord, are you sure? Are you sure this is the best plan for me today? Are you sure? But we can take comfort remembering these truths from from our Father. Isaiah 55 verses 8 through 9 says, where God is telling us, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Or Lamentations 3, 37 through 38 tells us, who is there who speaks and it comes to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both good and ill go forth? So while we understand that the Lord's complete sovereignty over every event in the universe um, is true, sometimes we can wonder if somehow, Lord, do you see me? Did I get lost maybe in your shuffling of all these major events in in history? Do you do you really can you see me now? I'm kind of I'm drowning here, and you feel like you're just trying to. Lord, catch me. And uh, we can feel like we have, maybe God has forgotten to find out where we are. But Proverbs 5.21 tells us something different about that. It says, For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he, the Lord, watches all that man's paths. The ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and the Lord sees it. He watches our paths. So even the path that the Lord has given us, he's watching us as we go along that path. Hebrews 4.13 reminds us, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so just knowing that the Lord sees what's going on in our lives, that's such an encouragement, isn't it? Especially if you feel like, I think I'm kind of like Joseph right now, and there's so many things happening in my life. I don't know if, I'm, if God has forgotten me, but the scriptures tell us otherwise. So we know that God sees what's going on in our lives. We also know that whatever is going on in our life comes from the Lord's kindness. He's not being mean to us. He's actually being the most kind to us as he orchestrates the details of our lives. And at times when we look at Joseph's story, it can feel like, wow, Lord, you were kind of rough with Joseph there. And sometimes we might feel that the Lord is a little rough in his dealings with us. But um, Martha Peace has said, some of God's ways seem kind, some do not but ultimately, all are kind. So good to be reminded of that. It might seem like maybe sometimes God is not kind in his dealings with us, but they are kind. The Lord's kindnesses to Joseph are seen in um, some of these ways. His father, Jacob, really did truly love him, and that is a kindness from the Lord. His brother, Reuben, did try to rescue him from the hand of his brothers, another kindness from the Lord. Joseph does win Potiphar's favor and enjoys the benefits of being a trusted member of his household. 
Uh, Joseph wins the jailer's favor when he does end up in prison, and so he enjoys the benefits of being an entrust, a trusted employee in prison. Um, even that was a kindness of the Lord. Genesis 39, 21, uh, we learn that the Lord is behind the kindnesses that God extended to Joseph. And it says in Genesis 39, 21, the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. And when you are hurting, those little kinds of kindnesses are especially sweet, aren't they? Just that balm for your heart. Maybe that someone notices or just that extra softness in a time of roughness um, because it was so difficult for him. And we see uh, the Lord's kindness to Joseph in that Joseph was able to interpret dreams, which the Lord used for great good. Uh, Joseph enjoyed honor after many years of humbling. Joseph was reunited with his family and got to see his aged father again. The Lord used Joseph to save even his own family from extinction. And Joseph is still used by God today as an example of godliness for us when we are in the middle of trials and adversity and suffering. And that is a kindness. And so what we, we learn even from Joseph's story is that sometimes we just need to look for the kindnesses from the Lord in the midst of being treated roughly by our circumstances sometimes. Um, we see ultimately that the Lord is so patient with us just because of the way he deals with us and bringing us to repentance. Um, when we deserve his wrath. Romans 2, 4 says, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Titus 3, 4 tells us that God showed his immense kind, mercy and kindness toward us in sending Christ to die on the cross for our sins. And so we see that ultimately we can even go down to, Lord, even if I can't find kindness in any of these other things, I can remember that you are kind to me just because you drew me to yourself. I deserve wrath, and you gave me kindness. That should be enough for me. And truly it is. It is the greatest kindness that God has given us. But what we are told in Psalm 103, 2, is to forget none of the Lord's benefits, to begin to look for God's kindnesses in our lives. Uh, Psalm 107.43 tells us that wise women consider and look for God's loving kindness in their lives. And so we want to be Psalm 107.43 women and look for the kindnesses of the Lord. What are, Lord, maybe you come to the end of the day, Lord, what were your kindnesses to me today? What were the things that you did for me today. And as we look for God's kindnesses that he extends to us throughout the day, it helps us to not see our circumstances in such black terms, especially if we are going through pretty deep and intense trials. William Cooper said, behind a frowning providence, the Lord hides a smiling face. And sometimes we can feel that I'm not seeing that smiling face. And it's like, Lord, where is it? Um, but it's there, and we have to begin to look for it. Lord, where are your, your uh, smiles? And Joseph's story reminds us that God's sovereignty and his kindness are perfectly mixed together. And it can be comfortable to think about, you know, Joseph. That's so good for Joseph, especially because, you know, we, we can see his story all put together, all the high points, and it all looks wonderful. But it can be um, a little difficult sometimes for us. And this is our third point, when uh, your life story parallels Joseph's. Um, because I am sure that there is at least one of you in your, uh, who's here today where you feel like, hey, I think my name is Josephina. And uh, my story parallels Joseph's right now. Um, it's just everything has been unexpected. It's been different. Um, I don't know what to do. It feels like God has not rescued me for years out of these trials. They keep coming upon us wave upon wave upon wave. And um, 
I don't, I haven't seen the big payoff yet. I haven't seen the like, okay, now I get it. It's all wonderful. There's none of that. It's still just slogging through the mud. And it feels hard and desperate. And what happens to us in the middle is that we haven't had the privilege yet of gaining that perspective of time, of being able to c climb the hill and look back and say, oh, yes, I see it all now. It's wonderful. We're, we're in the middle of it. And so what do we do when we're in the middle? What things do we need to think when we're in the middle of going through some of these hard things that God has allowed in our lives? And I think one of the things that's helpful is just to remember when Joseph was in the middle of his life, he didn't know what God was doing either. And um, it's encouraging, actually, to know Joseph didn't get it either, but he was still faithful. He still kept entrusting himself to the Lord. And so that's what, one of the things that God is asking of us. Will you keep trusting me even in the middle of whatever it is that I'm doing in your life. God oversaw every detail of Joseph's life, and he made sure that Joseph was born at just the right time and in just the right location, and that Joseph experienced all the right things so that in the end he could be made ruler in Egypt in order to preserve that fledgling nation so that eventually the Messiah could be born and that we today could experience salvation through our faith in Jesus Christ. And that same God who orchestrated all those details in Joseph's life is still the same, isn't he? And he's still working out all the details in your life and in my life. He doesn't change, Malachi 3.6 tells us. And so we can trust that same God who was working out all those details in Joseph's life as he works out those details in your life. Now, Joseph had no assurance when he was waiting those 17 years from the time he became a slave. He had no assurance that there was going to be this wonderful thing at the end. Joseph didn't know that eventually, if he just hung on for 17 more years, you're going to be second ruler of Egypt. He didn't know that. As far as he knew, he was going to die in that prison. And that's where he was going to be the rest of his life. He didn't know. He had to keep going on with life as it was. He was living in the middle. And yet, Joseph survived. He, um, not only did he survive going through all the middle time, he thrived. He kept entrusting himself to the Lord. You know the, the hymn, How Firm a Foundation? There is um, the one stanza that says, When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be your supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. And so this is what, that's what God is doing with some of you right now is that you're in pretty difficult cir circumstances. Maybe you've had the wind knocked out of you, and you're wondering, how did I get here? And, uh, and yet the Lord has a design, doesn't he? Thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Psalm 119.71 tells us where the psalmist came to understand that it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I would learn your word. And that is definitely true. Whenever we go through hard times and trials, God's word is our lifeline, isn't it? It's good for me that I was afflicted just so I would learn God's word, that I would hide it in my heart, that I would think on it, because it is my lifeline. And living with continued unmet expectations and circumstances that are wildly different than anything we ever was, thought would happen in our lives. This is where I thought I was going, and now I'm over here. How did this happen? But this is God's plan for me. Because if it was God's plan for me to be over here, I would be, right? I would be here. Because there is nothing of God's plan that can be thwarted. So I'm over here, which means this is God's plan for me. Oh, my. So now 
this is where God wants me to live. How can I live here well? How can I live here well? So that brings us to our fourth point, truths to tell yourself when you're in the middle of your story. When you're in the middle of your story, you don't have the perspective of time and history to look back over your life and gain insight into it. Um, so you have to think rightly in the middle of, our st of your story. At least I do. When you're in the middle of the story, you need to know that it won't last forever. There is nothing that happens to us right now that will last forever. It feels like it, but it's not going to. There will be an end to this time of uncertainty, um, this time of gloom or sorrow or anger or whatever it is that you're facing. There will be some change at some point. It won't always be as black or as difficult or as so much of a pressure cooker time as what you're experiencing right now. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 reminds us, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. It's just momentary, this affliction. It'll be over in 18 more years, but it's still momentary according to God's eternal plan. So not only do we need to remember that it won't last forever, number two, when you're in the middle of your story, you need to know that God really is sovereign over every event in your life. Deuteronomy 32, 39 says, where God is speaking, he says, See now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded it. It is I who heal, and there is no one who can deliver from my hands. God is really, really, really sovereign over every detail in our lives. Jerry Bridges in his book, Trusting God, said, if there is a single event in all of the universe that can occur outside of God's sovereign control, then we cannot trust him. But can we trust him? Yes. Which means God is sovereign over every detail in our lives. Number three, when you're in the middle of your story, you need to know that God intended Joseph's story to be an encouragement for you which is encouraging because Romans 15.4 tells us whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So if you're struggling, you need to go to the scriptures, look at those who've gone before and gain encouragement from what God has done and taught them in their lives. Romans 8, 28, we know this, that God causes all things to work together for good. And Joseph understood that. That's basically what he said in Genesis 50, 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Number four, when you're in the middle of your story, you need to know that you can live by faith for as long as the Lord wants you to be in the middle as long as he deems necessary. Uh, Hebrews 11, many of you know that, is the, it's the famed hall of faith of all the believers who've gone before. And they had all of these things that happened in their lives. But it says in verse 39 of Hebrews 11, all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Some of them didn't ever see the end of their life where it all got better all at once, but they trusted God all the way through to the end. And so can we. If they did before us and they were mortals, then we can too. Because Hebrews 11.6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. We need to if we want to please the Lord, then we need to, by, by faith, in just these little, little bits, little ways, begin to put our trust in the Lord. Lord, today was your kindness to me. You are sovereign over all of these plans and these parts of my life. I can trust you. 
Charles Spurgeon said this about pressing on in unchanged or difficult circumstances. He said, between here and heaven, we have no guarantee that the road will be easy or the sea smooth. We have no promise that we will be kept like flowers in a house safe from the breath of frost or veiled from the heat of the sun. The voice of wisdom says, be patient, be patient, be patient, for you may need a triple measure of patience to be ready for the trial. Wise words, isn't it? We don't know what God intends for our lives. So even if you are the poster child for a life of unmet expectations, that you feel that your life rivals Joseph's and all of the things that have gone on, um, you can keep trusting the Lord. You can persevere. And eventually, whether it's in this life or when we are with the Lord in heaven, we will begin to see how God pulled all the strands of our lives together for some great and glorious purpose. Samuel Rutherford said, why should I be afraid when the Lord plows in my life, when he makes deep furrows upon my soul? I know that the Lord is not a lazy farmer, and he intends a crop. And so that's what God is doing with some of us and in our lives, that God intends a crop. And at times, he needs to plow deep furrows, doesn't he? But there's a purpose in it all. And so we don't need to be afraid. It's an encouragement for us. And so let's bow um, before the Lord right now. And I'd, I'm just going to give you some time of quiet to talk to the Lord just about what you've heard and uh, spend a little bit of um, quiet. And then I will um, close us in prayer in just a minute. Lord, first we want to come before you and, and we want to thank you for Joseph's story. Thank you that you recorded it in the scriptures to encourage us, as Romans 15, 4 says, so that we might have hope when we are going through times that are similar. Lord, we want to thank you for Psalm 33, 11 that reminds us that your plans were formed from long ago. Before we were even born, you had a specific plan for our lives and that you are getting us there exactly in, um, in the way and in the means and at the time that you intend us to be. We thank you for Philippians 1, 6 that reminds us that he who began a good work in us will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Father, thank you for that. We thank you for your kindness, Lord. Help us to um, search for the kindnesses that you give us in our lives, it, that even when you are bringing difficulties, you also give kindnesses. Uh, that your sovereignty is always perfectly mixed with kindness. Father, thank you so much. Lord, help us to persevere with hope, to cling to your scriptures, to remember as Psalm 119.75 says, it is good for me that I was afflicted so that I would learn your word. Lord, that we would love your word, that we would love you better because of the trials that you have allowed, that you have given in our lives. 
Lord, help us to wait well. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of faith. And oh, Lord, we do look forward to that day when we will see Jesus face to face, that we will stand before him blameless with great joy. Build in us an eagerness for you, Lord, and um, grant us perseverance in the meantime as you um, continue to orchestrate the details of our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.